This is an introduction to the Chip Whisper CW305 target board from New AE Technology Inc. Um, so this is a target board for the Arctic 7 series of FPGA. So you can see the board here has the um, 35T FPGA mounted. And this board is available with the 100T is actually the, the most popular model we sell. Um, but it also has a socket that I'll show you in a moment that lets you adjust uh, the exact type of FPGA you put in. So, as you would sort of expect, the core part of this board is the FPGA itself. Um, but, ra unlike a normal FPGA board, there's quite a bit more support circuitry than you might otherwise see. So, if we zoom out here to show the whole board, um, what you'll see is that there's the standard type of USB interface. So, this chip here provides communication, and this is done over a address data bus. So basically there's um, eight bits of data, um, a number of address lines. So you can use quite a few if you want. A lot of the examples will use, you know, 16 or 20 of those lines, um, as well as like read and write strobe flags. So it makes it really easy to make a memory mapped uh, registers in here that you just read and write over USB. So there's a bunch of examples for that um, if you want to see how that works. Now, the other thing we have is we have some clocks down here. Um, so this is actually a PLL chip that's programmable over USB. So I'll show you, I'll show you how you can use that to adjust the, the running frequency. Um, but this is handy because you can do stuff like, say you have a, an AES core in here, and you want to check you know, how does it run at 10 megahertz versus 100. You can just switch to the frequency um, externally without having to modify any of the clock logic on board this chip. Um, so that can be really handy to avoid changes here. Um, also useful for stuff like uh, puff design, so physically cl clonable functions to check at different frequencies. Um, so this has three outputs actually, and some of them go to the FPGA, one goes to this SMA connector, um, and there's two others to so the F SMA connectors at the bottom here. Uh, what you see is that some of them can be used as inputs or outputs, basically for clocks, as well as having these little test probes for your uh, oscilloscope pins. Now, some of the other stuff that makes this board a lot different from a regular sort of FPGA target is up at the top here. Um, and what we have is there's a shunt resistor. Um, so we can see this little surface mount shunt resistor right here. Uh, and this lets you do basically power measurement. So you can see if you have something like a encryption algorithm and you want to see what sort of uh, power leakage it has. This lets you make really easy measurements using either an SMA connector directly connected to it or with a 20 dB um, low noise amplifier here. Now you'll also notice that there's this sort of loop of wire here. Um, so what this loop of wire does is this makes it a little easier and if I just go from the side you can probably see a better view of that. Um, you can do stuff like if you have a current probe you can connect it in here. Uh, you can cut the wire if you want to isolate it. And it's soldered into, these are two sort of gold pegs on the circuit board, so you don't have to worry as much about lifting PCB pads compared to if you're trying to desolder just the resistor. Uh, the voltage supply itself is provided by a switch mode supply. And this switch mode supply is actually programmable. So you'll see at the top, there's this DMM uh, that's basically telling you what the current um, power supply is. So we can take a look at that DMM and on the computer software, uh, I can actually adjust that. So I can say, you know, I want to run this at 1.05 volts. And you can see it goes up there. Um, or we can undervolt it, you know, 0.8 volts. Um, so there it's showing about 803 millivolts. So again, this is handy for a lot of stuff. Um, with glitch attacks, it can be useful to put the device right on the edge of where it's susceptible. With puff type designs, it can be useful to test the puff at um, other, you know, out of spec operating voltages and seeing how it changes your design. Um, with the, the VC int supply, you also have the, uh, so these are just sort of standard banana jacks, will fit in here. So if you have a bench power supply, uh, you can easily plug those in instead if you don't want to use the, um, the external, the internal supply, and then put it over to that. It also can help if you want a little bit lower noise uh, situation for the internal power supply. Um, there is an add-on module that gives you linear regulators only for the 3.3 and the 1.8 volts. So these are the IO and AUX voltages. And again, that can help a little bit with noise, um, noise there. 
Now, I'll show you right now, just as I mentioned, this is actually one of our prototype boards, so it looks a little different. Um, the difference is here, it actually has a, um, a BGA socket. Um, so this socket module is a fairly high-end made by Advanced Interconnect, and it actually allows you to change the FPGA. So there's a little heat spreader thing there. Um, and you can see you can just drop a BGA type FPGA right onto this socket. So the socket itself has a whole bunch of spring. Um, basically, all of these are little sp pogo pins that sort of nestle the, um, nestle the FPGA ball grid array balls on the underside of it. So they were all fit in. Let's see if we can. So there's the, the FPGA itself. Make sure we get a focus here. Um, but it just fits down in, uh, oops, in that guy. Fits on there, and then you can close that. Um, there we go, and then spin this. So there's a little wrench you use to torque that down to the correct spec. Um, but this this is just another option again for the uh, the type of target device. Now, as I mentioned, we can adjust the, the operating frequency. So the, the control of this is done. Um, there's a GUI as part of the Chip Whisper software, but it just uses Python. Um, so you can also control this from a command line or from another program. Um, and the default system here, we can see these lights. Um, this light is flashing with the USB interface clock. This light is flashing with the crypto clock. So. What I'm going to do is if I change, you know, the crypto clock, I can show you. So it's running at 10 megahertz right now. If I run it at 100 megahertz, you'll see that light flashes really fast. Um, if I run it at like 2 megahertz, we'll see that that speed drops way down. So you can see the green light flashing very slowly. Um, so this is just giving us some feedback on the, the operating frequency there. Uh, on the back side of the board, so because it's designed for power analysis, you see some other stuff like um, these here. So the, these just have some um, bolts in them with standoffs for sort of to form as feet. Uh, but you can remove these and use the, this bolt pattern to mount the board securely, um, as well as obviously the bolts at the side, the mounting holes here. Uh, but these ones are nice because they're very close to the FPGA. If you're doing stuff like using an EM probe, um, there's these alignment marks all on the top and bottom side to help you um, align, you know, if you have either for power measurements or for fault injection using an EM probe. Um, on the same vein, on the bottom side, you have an option of having these decoupling capacitors for the VCC in supply. You can either mount them or not mount them. Um, and they're all sort of segregated here, so you can really easily see uh, the specific VCC in supplies that go to the um, or decoupling capacitors for the VCC and supply. Uh, finally, the other thing I forgot to mention is if you are doing glitch attacks, one of the problems people will run into is you insert a glitch here, um, and this glitch will, you know, if it's a voltage glitch or even an EM-induced uh, voltage glitch, it can propagate over to your USB interface chip and cause it to reset. So this is just a hassle. Um, to avoid this, we have all of these little chips here are ESD protection diodes. Um, and so all the I.O. lines between the FPGA and the USB interface chip have resistors as well as ESD protection diodes. So they're designed to present, prevent any bad glitches from going to this guy over to the USB chip. Um, and if you do, so, you know, as part of glitching it, you're probably going to corrupt the FPGA memory. So I'll just toggle the power here to the target device, um, which you can also, there's a little switch here specifically designed for turning it off. So this powers down the FPGA without um, affecting the rest of the board. And you'll see, so it lost the configuration memory, the FPGA done LED comes on, so this just indicates the FPGA is unconfigured. Um, and I can just program it from the software. So I hit the program button, and you'll see it pretty quickly is done uh, programming. So it takes about two seconds with this RTX 35T. Um, of course, there's other configuration options, like the JTAG port over here connects to the FPGA. Uh, and there's a spy memory sort of standard 
on the back that you would expect from an FPGA, and with these, you can select them. The, the mode switches here let you configure the device. So what the heck can you do with this board? Um, basically, if you are interested in doing sort of power analysis, if you're interested in doing glitching, it's a really useful uh, board for that. And this connector here is actually the same as on the Chip Whisperer, so either the Chip Whisperer Lite or the Chip Whisperer Pro. Um, so if I have one here, you can see at the bottom, it has that same 20 pin header. It just plugs together. Um, and this will allow me to send clock information from the Chip Whisperer or from the FPGA to the Chip Whisperer or vice versa. So if I want to do clock glitching, I can use the I have to use the Chip Whisperer Lite or Chip Whisperer Pro to generate a glitchy clock um, that I can feed back into the device. And so I'm just going to connect up here. So what I've done is I have the um, I have the Chip Whisperer connected. So we have a, a power measurement line here, and that goes to the measure input on the Chip Whisperer. And then this ribbon cable provides the trigger and clock information. Um, data transfer itself is done over the USB cable, so it's there's no serial you know protocol or anything like that. So on the computer side, and there's a number of tutorials, um, so you can look out for the tutorial videos that will be posted. All we're basically doing is we're able to send data to the this board while we wait, um, you know, while we record the power traces of it, or we can insert glitchy clocks while we're doing uh, various FPGA work and see how that's affecting the results here. And let's just turn off a few things. And you can see as I'm clicking the button, so the, the, there's a blue LED that indicates uh, encryption is happening okay. But that's sort of just a really, really quick overview. There, there's a bunch of other stuff you can do, so I can actually switch these around too, so you can choose to tr have the clock run. Um, if I change it this way, I can have the clock run from the chip whisperer to the board, or I can use the clock on the board and send it out to this device. But that's just a really quick overview of what you can do with the CW305, and I hope you found this useful.